All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for your coming. Uh, I appreciate you all being here. Uh, we're starting just a few minutes late since the keynote ran a little bit over, uh, but we'll get started here. Uh, this is a workshop session, so it will be a little bit longer than some of the other sessions. Uh, there will be some pausing here as we kind of work, work, work through any issues that folks are running into and uh, help really kind of understand how things are working. Uh, it'll be very interactive, uh, so if you do have your laptop available to follow along and actually uh, perform some of these actions, we're gonna, we're, we've got a few different goals that we're gonna try to accomplish Today, which I'll, I'll cover in just a minute. So um, make sure you got your laptop there, and um, if you're having any issues with power, uh, find yourself towards maybe the edge of the room. Um, so uh, today's talk is going to be on GitOps in general. Uh, we're going to do uh, talk about really how do we how can we apply some of the principles that we've seen with infrastructure as code for infrastructure, but for really kind of how do we bring this all the way to like our actual operations and, ex and running, running our applications in our cloud or uh, other um, server environments. Um, so uh, with this, uh, we're going to be taking sort of a couple different philosophies really and trying to apply them. I will be using some tools today uh, that are uh, maybe opinionated. Uh, so there will be some opinionation coming into the, into the talk, um, but also we'll try to qualify a lot of this as saying, you know, hey, these are general principles. We're going to use a specific type of tool to help us along that way. Uh, but you can really apply this in many different ways. This is just one way that we will we'll show this off. Um, and I can talk through. And if uh, we end up having extra time towards the end, then we can even try to play around with some of those uh, alternative technologies and, and, and approaches. Uh, I will say that actually a lot of the, the types of technologies and tools that we use here today um, are tools that I somewhat use in my, 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 uh, my organization and somewhat don't use in my organization. Some of these is for that reason is because it's simpler and easier to work with in this environment. Um, and just often we have all sorts of interesting uh, hodgepodge uh, environments and workflows that we have for our own organization. So uh, take pieces from this and, and apply them in the way that works best for your org um, and try to make something uh, interesting, useful out of it. Uh, so great. So uh, just to get started, first of all, my name is Will. Uh, Full name is William Schmidt, but I'm the technical co-founder at Rightfoot. Uh, I've been working uh, there for about three years full time now. Uh, but generally, my 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 career has been through a number of different infrastructure engineering fields. Kind of started my career in electric power, working more uh, with with software. If I was working there, I was in Fortran. Uh, but now, kind of moved my way over into uh, network infrastructure, and then ultimately now into financial infrastructure. So, uh, always been really passionate about hey, like what can we do on these lower layers in the stack to build way more interesting things on top of. Um, and so, these types of principles is kind of also why I end up getting really passionate about topics like DevOps and how do we make our engineering engineering organizations efficient, um, make sure that they can do things uh, in a way that's predictable and reliable. So uh, just to uh, reiterate and set some expectations for this session, uh, it will be hands-on. It is a developer session. Uh, so if you are not a developer, much of this may not be um, as relatable. Uh, and we will be diving in pretty deep into actually uh, using a shell and working with a terminal to actually uh, affect a lot of our changes. Um, I will be pausing. Uh, if you have a question live, please ask it. This is going to be a long workshop session, so just raise your hand, call out, and then we can go through this. So that will be casual in that respect. Um, we will be using coding tools, and we will be working from a shell, so uh, be prepared to do that. Um, I am on a Mac. Most of the commands that I'll be sharing are more Mac-oriented. Uh, generally, that's not a huge difference. Package managers are available on all, on all systems. You may have to use your own package manager if you're on Linux or something like that, or some Linux variant. Um, and uh, there may be some syntax changes between some, um, some different operating systems. So, uh, but in general, we'll work, uh, work, from a, uh, work generally with a Mac environment today. Uh, but if there's any questions, if anybody wants to have um, help getting ported over to a different environment, we can do that as well. Um, and so since this is an interactive session, uh, I would recommend uh, visiting just this bit.ly link. This is just the slide deck here. You should have view access. Let me know if you are not able to access this. Uh, and that should give you the ability to so you can like copy everything uh, from the deck uh, since we'll be running commands. And rather than copy pasting, well, we well, have yeah, copy paste considered harmful, but uh, I think copy paste using your eyes and having to type down will be a little bit, uh, a little bit more risky. So go ahead. Uh, I'll leave this up here just for one second here. Uh, it's hopefully not too bad. Bitly GitOps dash DevCon dash 2022. All right. Anyone still looking to see the hold that on there for me for one more minute? Beautiful. 
All right. And then, and then the last piece here, and, and hopefully this will be a little easier now, with a little bit longer URLs, uh, since we are working, uh, we're, maybe you now have the slide decks available. Um, today's repository that we're going to be working with, we have a Git repo here uh, that has most of the pieces that we'll be working with today, along with some patch files to help us kind of accelerate through so we're not writing code just from by hand. Um, you can go ahead and visit this. Uh, I would recommend uh, taking the time now, fork this into your own uh, organization or workspace, uh, and we will be, there's a, there is a shell script there, it requires two environment variables to be set, which is a, a Docker Hub account and a GitHub account. If you have other types of repositories uh, or another uh, repo registry for, for your Docker images, go right ahead. If you want to use something else like Git, GitLab or some other um, Git service, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but ultimately, there's a simple shell script in there. It should just go ahead and replace kind of all of my username instances with your username instances uh, for Docker Hub and GitHub. I will come back to this a little bit as we'll touch on that um, a few slides from now. You can do this in parallel in the background asynchronously if you'd like. Um, you are ultimately, up, it's, you, you are welcome. I would love for you all to follow along and actually perform these, uh, these commands. I will be doing this live here as well with you all. So uh, any issues that you run into or I run into, you might run into and vice versa. Uh, but you're also just welcome to here, hang out for the ride and just observe and see how this stuff works together. Um, but go ahead and, and just get this, this repository forked and we can get started. All right, so now into the actual content and, rather than the setup. Um, so we're gonna talk about GitOps today. Uh, this is like a, a newer term-ish that's been coined by a few different organizations. Uh, it means a lot of different things to everybody. Uh, just about every term in, in our industry and, and in computer science in general is overloaded. Uh, so uh, in, this, in, this, in this session, we'll really be talking about GitOps in the spirit of really DevOps where we are using Git in some sort of version control system to drive our operations. Um, Nothing says it has to be Git. Git, of course, is now really our most popular version control system. You can always be using something like Mercurial, SVN, Perforce, uh, an SFTP server, a, a, a Windows file share, uh, whatever you really wanted to do, as long as you've got some sort of canonical state that you're going to be used. Um, ironically, of course, we're now kind of describing Git as like a centralized repository that defines the, the canonical state for what we want to achieve, um, despite Git being spirit a distributed version control system. Um, but the whole spirit of this is that we're going to actually version controlling our configuration changes. Everything becomes version controlled. Uh, that means like if we're updating an environment variable, uh, if we're changing how many replicas we want to be deployed or changing how many, what the min-max range of that is, uh, and, and what version is running on a particular uh, deployment for uh, any given release that we have uh, going. Uh, all this becomes version controlled. We're going to be focused really on config and applications today. We won't go too much into the infrastructure side of things. Uh, I think my, my abstract included, maybe we use Terraform to help stand some of this up. We're going to skip over the Terraform parts today and really just focus in on the app side of things. Um, and we can talk about how we can relate it to infrastructure config towards the end. Um, and then finally, we really can start co-locating more of our workflows. Um, it's not really any sort of requirement, but you can now really start co-locating your deployment workflows right up with your code bases. That might be for multiple environments, also along with your infrastructure, creating dependencies between your infrastructure and your, um, your applications, uh, depending upon how coupled or decoupled you want uh, those workflows to be. So um, I'm going to kind of like roughly describe kind of the spirit of what like GitOps is going to happen. There's, there's, there's a few parties involved in, in anything like this. And, and really the hallmark two, two pieces here are in purple. And that's our, our desired state and then our actual state. Um, so our Git repository functions as a declarative source of saying, hey, what do we actually want to be running? I want to have three different uh, environments running of the same uh, service, perhaps, and I want to have each one of them have three replicas. Uh, I want the new, I want one, the staging environment to run this version. I want the production environment to run this version, and maybe some sandbox or dev environment, whatever you're trying to to release. Have all these different versions and different configurations, different uh, API keys, etc. That all goes into our Git repository that we say this is what we want to have happen, and it's just a record. It's just a de declaration. Um, 
And then uh, on, the, on the bottom right, we have production, which is what's actually running in production. Well, when we were starting here, we first put a Git repository together saying what we want. Nothing's going to be there. Uh, but what we're going to then do is say, hey, let's put, introduce some sort of reconciling object, some sort of machine that is going to, its job is to anneal the difference between production and, and the desired state, and is going to try to affect that desired state onto production. Uh, this can be done through a ton of different things. Uh, today we're going to be using Argo CD to help us do that. They, that will function as our reconciler. But like nothing like says you have to do that. It could be a shell script that's doing these types of things. It's just something that's actively monitoring and looking for changes that are in your desired state and looking for what the actual state can be. Uh, our organization uses Terraform pretty heavily to, to accomplish quite of this. It's really just some sort of tool that's looking at diffs and trying to reconcile things. Uh, and reconciliation applies to us all in many different types of layers, whether or not in a technological uh, layer or in a financial layer. Uh, so this whole just idea of state of reconciling two different states together. Um, and then of course, then uh, the spirit is that we have just producers of, of desired state being developers or our CI and CD pipeline. And we'll really focus on more about our CD pipeline here uh, and, and see how we can be able to uh, release config changes or release uh, updates to our applications. All right. So why is this important for fintech in particular? Uh, we were at fintech DevCon, and GitOps is a cool DevOps uh, concept. But in particular, for like our field, uh, we find that in in finance, we're we're constantly uh, looking much more at being able to really concretely and very specifically and predictably say what did we accomplish when we're moving money around or money money has been created, destroyed in some fashion or moved around. Uh, we want to be able to do a few different things with actually our software that's running. We want to be able to be able to audit it and say what was actually running at a certain time, what was the life cycle of our application, when did it get deployed, when did it upgrade, did it get reversed. Uh, at some point we want to have a complete audit trail and be able to say exactly what versions and what things were being uh, run at any given uh, point of time. Uh, in general, we, we, we really kind of see good record keeping and auditability is really the heart at, of finance and, and fintech. Uh, we want to be able to be predictable. We want to be able to actually say, hey, like what is running is very explicitly documented and something that we can actually go and visit. Uh, rather than having a developer on your team who's run maybe 10 different commands to accomplish some sort of release, uh, has just followed a run book and perhaps has run it a little bit differently each, each time or maybe somebody hacked around and tried to get their own uh, thing going to get a release going we actually can have more of a documented standardized release process that says, hey, this is how it runs. We, we really offload this to a CD release pipeline. Um, and then we can just describe that in Git and it's very clear um, and we have a standard around it rather than um, having some sort of manual out of band process. Uh, third is rec replicability. And the idea here can come to like when we're, we're looking to do a disaster recovery or we're trying to actually replay events that have happened. Uh, we want to be able to actually have some st standard way to be able to uh, just reapply this and recreate the environment that we've had. Maybe get, create a reproducible side environment to reproduce a bug. Uh, having something that is based in Git means, hey, I just need to reapply and restart all of these services by just saying, hey, reconciler, can you achieve this state again? We just have some sort of declarative state. And then finally, traceability, which means we can actually associate our actions um, that have been taken by our software and associate them with actual specific releases. So now into kind of what we're actually going to accomplish during the workshop today uh, with these sort of GitOps uh, ideas in mind. So first of all, we're going to, uh, to, to uh, deploy like a local Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you will want and need to be familiar with Kubernetes uh, for this session. Uh, we will deploy Argo CD onto that cluster. Uh, and we are going to then deploy a very simple uh, application to that cluster using our Argo CD as a tool. Um, and uh, then finally, uh, we will actually perform some updates and rollbacks, those types of standard operations we might expect for releases uh, from uh, our CI CD pipeline. Uh, and then we'll just drive some very simple deployment strategies around like just releasing to like a staging environment automatically in a simple way. What we're not going to do today, we're not going to really learn about Kubernetes. Uh, this isn't like a lesson on Kubernetes principles. Uh, Kubernetes happens tends to be just the standard approach that we'll uh, all be using. Uh, we won't be productionizing anything in this Kubernetes environment. Uh, we're not going to be designing microservice meshes or anything like that. 
Um, we're not going to even use some of the more advanced uh, or standard tools you might use to actually configure and templatize your releases. We're going to do like very vanilla Kubernetes YAML files for this. Uh, so we're not going to use Helm. We're not going to use Customize uh, or any other tool that you might be familiar with. Uh, and uh, we're not going to be automating the bootstrapping of this environment. This will be a little bit hands-on, so uh, a, a departure from the spirit of everything being kind of committed to Git. We won't do the bootstrapping aspect of that through Git today. Um, and we won't do any sort of advanced deployment strategies where you might be doing like blue-green releases or anything like that. Um, that is kind of something that you can kind of take from here and, and go with um, and apply in whatever your particular uh, strategy in your organization is. Okay, so uh, this is like a, a pretty typical like continuous delivery workflow that we're going to be looking through and trying to affect in some way. Uh, the spirit of this, we're going to kind of everything is canonical on one mainline stable branch in Git. Uh, we're going to kind of work from left to right as time goes by. Um, and the spirit is like whenever some sort of change is being made to our code base, uh, typically a developer is going to make a branch, check out, so check out that branch, write some code to it, submit a pull request, and another developer is going to go through the code review cycle. Whatever CI process you have, run your unit tests, solve your integration tests, any static analysis will get executed on that branch. And then once that's been approved and all of our checks have been satisfied, and a, you know, code review is just another type of CI check, it just tends to be with a person. Uh, maybe not always, but uh, we're going to merge that code in. And at that point, our, our mainline branch uh, has some sort of config in it still that had like, an older version of code for, let's say, our staging environment. Nothing has changed to our configurations. Nothing has changed at all uh, about what is running in our production environments. I'll use production as the overloaded way of just like things that are running in a cloud environment rather than particularly like a prod environment in your cloud environment uh, versus like staging and dev. Uh, but so something running in prod, nothing's been changed to our configs there. We've just submitted code. And the, and the reality is that like what code we run in different environments is going to differ. Like we're not going to run the same code in staging and prod. So what code is there is not what's being run. Code is just a representation of what our current stable understanding of our code base is. And we can choose to release that. And that's how we're going to release a little bit. Uh, is there your hand up in the back or is that just, no, you're good. You, uh, I just want to make sure I'm not ignoring anybody. Okay, cool. So now what's going to happen, though, is at this point, every time we have a commit to our stable branch, we are going to do some sort of CD process that's going to build those artifacts. Uh, hopefully, if we have a, a strong build environment, it's going to be very lightweight, and if you, we're going to have a caching system, and, and you won't have any actual work done if nothing's changed. But in this case, we made some code change, so something is going to change about one of our build artifacts. So some Docker container is going to get changed and produce a new digest because its contents have changed. Like there's been new code that's been submitted that produces a new digest. The, uh, that CD process then can say, ah, I've got a deployment strategy that says release really every single change to my staging, my dev environments, so that we can continuously use them for testing and validating and qualifying releases. Uh, maybe we, we do like a continuous delivery to production and that maybe comes next, but, uh, or maybe we do that on a periodic basis, uh, but we don't have to necessarily do that. It's up to us to kind of d determine that strategy based off of your organization's preference. But that CD process says, like, hey, it's time to now release an artifact that's changed as soon as it changes. We'll spawn up and say, all right, cool. I'm going to actually go update a config file that says I've got a new image available. I'm going to build it, and I'm going to now get a new digest. And I want my staging and my dev environments, all my de development environments, to actually start running this new version. And all that means is I'm going to actually produce a pull request that just replaces that digest with a new digest in some YAML file. Uh, lots of YAML on YAML we'll, we'll be seeing. Uh, and then that pull request can be auto-approved and auto-merged, uh, however you want to do an auto-approval or an auto-merge process. Uh, so uh, and once that merges now in, the config has changed. No code has changed. But now we said actually specific environments are going to run really a specific version of our code, which is just based off of some uh, SHA, some digest of our Docker container. Um, that CD process, in our case, will be Argo CD, sees that new config that it says, hey, run this new version, uh, and it's going to go ahead and anneal that into our prod environment. 
Now, down the line, if we have uh, more like asynchronous release processes, like to prod, we're going to release once a week or once a day or two or three times a week, whatever your process is, or after certain environments have passed some other set of qualifications, then another process can spawn up. And all it does is produce a pull request. And it, it may be a machine producing a pull request, but a pull request is a pull request. And it's just that same standard workflow that we're used to with uh, developers writing code. Just a change has been proposed, a machine has proposed it, and maybe a machine can auto-approve it based off of the conditions that, hey, we're just gonna, we're gonna allow all releases to staging and dev to be automatically released, no oversight. Maybe in production we want to actually require a review and we'll say, hey, you know, production YAML files have to have a human observe that, at least uh, to be present for a release. Uh, but in general, like, we can still control all of that with all the same Git mechanisms that we are used to uh, for just developing software. Any questions on this? All right. So now, now we're going to actually start diving into some of the tools that we're going to use today. Uh, Git will be our version control system. Uh, we'll be just standard using Git commits. Uh, GitHub will be our Git repository. I apologize if you all use another, another uh, uh, centralized Git repository or, man or, or manage Git, uh, like GitLab or something, Bit Bitbucket. Uh, we're going to be using Docker to build and uh, tag our container images uh, and Docker Hub to store as our central Docker registry. Nothing says you have to do this on your, nothing says you have to use Docker uh, and Docker Hub. There's plenty of tools. Uh, our organization uses um, a synthetic grouping of Docker plus with Bazel, we, 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 use, uh, we build like, more hermetic and reproducible images in that way. Uh, and we use like GCR as our artifact re registry. Um, we're going to be using Kubernetes uh, as really just to define declarative application deployments. Um, and then Minikube to actually run a local Kubernetes cluster on our machine. We'll go through the installation steps on this, which will take a little bit of time. Uh, if you have like a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, nothing says you can't use that. If you want to have like some dev environment, uh, you can definitely bring your own Kubernetes in any way that works for you. Uh, and then finally, the one tool that's really kind of going to be the more, most interesting tool of this uh, will be Argo CD. Uh, this is not like a product of ours or anything that we really directly contribute to. It is just a tool. There's other options uh, like Flux CD. There's Terraform can work as well. And just some simple shell scripts are plenty, plenty enough to be able to do these types of things as well. Uh, but this will be a cool, unique, uh, interesting one that you can pull together quickly. OK. so. Uh, as we think about like, well, how do we do these things, uh, and, and like, how do we are we actually writing our our, our Git code, our, our our YAML files, and and what we're trying to accomplish with like these reconciling tools? Uh, there's just really just generally two ways we can do just about everything in software, and this applies to um, actual software design and uh, things like event-driven architecture, as well as just like our our configuration code. And and well, first of all, there's there's a declarative approach. Uh, which is saying what you want, has nothing to do with how to do it, just says what I want, which is what our GitOps strategy would be, uh, which contrasts with imperative approaches where we would try to describe how to do something. An imperative approach would be a developer getting onto a command line, running kubectl apply or helm upgrade uh, to actually do those things. That's a very imperative approach where we're just saying you know, what things to do or how to do it rather than just what we want to have as a desired outcome. Um, in a declarative approach with GitOps here today, like desired state is annealed asynchronously. Uh, it's achieved through these reconciliation loops that are constantly looking to see what's the difference in drift here and how can we close that gap. Um, while in an imperative approach, desired state is really executed synchronously. Like we're doing a few different steps in order, um, and we have to actually do these direct executions, possibly indepotent, uh, but we have to execute these steps in a specific order. Um, and then one last final piece here on kind of the basics of what we want, want to understand. Again, this isn't a Kubernetes lesson, but the basics that we want to understand as we go into here. Kubernetes is very light, has kind of two major types of concepts. There's workloads, and then there's networking. Um, and in this case, uh, workloads are usually described by kind of like two major things that we will, will experience today. A pod, which is nothing more than just like a basic unit of running a container. You can have multiple containers depending upon what your needs are, but typically a container uh, with some environment variables passed into it. It's the actual operation of, of a container running on a server. 
And then a deployment, which is really a little bit more of a mutable description of like, how many pods do I want? What environment variables can they have? And we can upgrade it and change that uh, over time uh, rather than having it sort of like a fixed a specific uh, instance, which is a pod. Uh, on the networking side, we're really not going to touch anything in networking today. We're going to just use a single deployment. We're not going to touch any of the exposing this to the internet or anything like that. We'll use uh, kubectl to port forward into, into our service today just to make it simple and straightforward. Uh, but uh, workloads can be exposed uh, on a host name with DNS internally, uh, externally with load balancers, and through uh, public DNS, uh, and those like two major concepts again, that we won't use. It would be like a service, which is just saying, hey, this is a thing, a collection of my, my pods that I'm running can be accessed uh, as like a microservice by other services uh, or uh, to the public internet. And then ultimately, ingress, which actually exposes that through um, to the outside world into our internal network. So uh, a few things we're going to start going now into actually running some stuff. So uh, a few things that we will need today are two counts. GitHub, if you don't have a GitHub account, you can create a free account today, uh, and a Docker Hub account as well. Uh, if you do have your own uh, sort of Docker Hub, or uh, sort of Docker registry or container registry, you're more than welcome to use that as well. Uh, it may take a little bit more customization uh, in our scripts, um, but it should be just about the same thing here. Um, so uh, if you haven't run that setup script already, uh, please go ahead and just export your uh, your uh, usernames as just some environment variables here so, so that script can use it. And we'll be reusing these uh, variables throughout a couple of commands here to make it work for you. So just give it a second here. If you don't have these accounts, just get this set up here into whatever shell you've got. Uh, I will pull up my shell as well and, and follow along with you. Um, and I'll make sure I get into my actual um, my, my repository here. And I just want to see, is this about, is that big enough for everybody or should I get a little bit larger here in, in our shell? See how much larger I can get. Is that legible for folks everywhere here? Yeah. Okay. I see affirmative nods at least from folks in the background, which makes me feel feel good that we're in a, we're in okay shape. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just export these for now um, and make sure that we are good to go. Um, if you haven't forked the repository already, please do. Perfect. And I will execute that little setup script to make sure I don't have any diffs. Um, and perfect, my repository is already set up with my usernames. Um, that, that script, you can open it up and, and inspect it. It's nothing more than just a couple sed commands run. Um, it is, again, one of those types of things where sed on Mac has a slightly different syntax than maybe you have if you're on a Linux machine. Um, so customize that a little bit if you need to. All right, so uh, those are our two accounts. Um, we're gonna just use a couple tools here. You don't have to necessarily use these tools, but, um, but I recommend getting them. These are super powerful if you're doing anything with YAML or JSON, which will be the brunt of any DevOps type of work that we're doing. So get yourself JQ so we can do some JSON querying and JSON replacement, uh, and then YQ as well. I was make a note um, that uh, YQ, there are two different YQs that are out there. Uh, there is one that ha has the same syntax as JQ and is kind of compatible with JQ. Um, and then there's one that has it's kind of, it's kind of built uh, from the ground up. Uh, we'll use the one that is called python-yq because it is just really a wrapper around JQ um, today just so we'll have the same exact syntax. If you want to amend it to your own uh, yq, go for it, but um, we will be using uh, the python yq if we can today. And then this will be the, the first big big thing that will take some time that I imagine some folks could run into. So uh, if you don't have Minikube running uh, on your machine already, well, let's get Minikube installed. This is just a very light, uh, very bare bones uh, um, uh, example of, or, uh, of, of just Kubernetes to run on your own machine. It'll run as a single node. Uh, it will use whatever uh, driver you would like for uh, managing uh, virtual machines. Uh, Today, I'm just going to be using Docker Engine. You can use HyperKit, uh, Hyper-V if you're on Windows, um, and uh, any other sort of really kind of preferred uh, driver. Uh, you can follow that link through there. That will give you the examples how to get whatever driver you would like configured and set up. Um, but we'll just assume for right now that we have um, that we have mini or sorry uh, Docker uh, installed here. And so what you'll want to do is uh, let's just make sure that we have a mini cube. Uh, cluster running. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get Minikube started. Um, 
we shouldn't really have any sensitivity to version or anything like that here. We're not going to do anything too wild. Um, so just get yourself whatever Minikube instance you've got uh, started up and whatever Kubernetes uh, version you've got, as long as it's something within the last couple years. And so once we get our Minikube cluster set up, we can actually start installing some pieces there. So uh, see if folks like have Minikube going or have a cluster running or would like a, some help getting that running. It can take a little bit of time to get installed since you do have to download something like a 300, 300 megabyte uh, image to, uh, to run kind of Kubernetes master. Anyone having any trouble? All right. Beautiful. All right, and I've got now Minikube installed here, and I can uh, I can access that. I should be able to. It, it will set up your Cube Cuddle context right away to Minikube. That is something to make sure. Make sure you're not connected to somehow your production instance. Uh, that when you're running this, we're going to do some um, some things that can make lots of changes to your cluster. So make sure Cube Cuddle is actually talking to uh, whatever uh, you want to actually um, talk to. Uh, and so we'll get kube cuddle here, uh, and we can just quickly at least, you know, hey, let's get some pods here, make sure there's nothing running in our cluster yet, which we would not expect to see anything. Uh, and I can just double check all our namespaces. And we've just got some of the kube system stuff running, which is great. Cool. So now that we have Minikube installed, our next big piece is going to actually start installing Argo and actually explore how we can use Argo to run our and manage our deployments. Um, so what you want to do, this is just really kind of from the Argo CD standard installation. Uh, we are going to get this set up. We're going to first install it and then configure it to watch our, our Git repository. Uh, so go ahead and get, create this namespace. We will cube cuddle create namespace namespace Argo CD. And then uh, this is kind of like this, the scary thing of like almost running you know, shell scripts uh, from the internet, directly curl piping them into shell. Uh, we will be doing something very similar here with a kubectl apply from the internet. Uh, you, this is, has a ton of stuff in it, and it's a very like basic setup. Um, there's lots of ways to customize Argo, uh, but we will go ahead and just grab that. Uh, hilarious that I've been signed out. There we go. All right. Uh, so let me grab this from my instance here. So I don't have to retype this entire piece. Uh, so you can just grab this and just go ahead and install. This is going to apply a ton of stuff. There's going to be some CRDs installed. There's going to be a bunch of Kubernetes services, deployments, network policies, et cetera. And now what we can do is actually go ahead and see uh, kubectl get pods uh, namespace Argo CD is where we, we installed this to. And we can see, uh, and we'll watch that to see them come up. So we'll see that there's now already like six different, seven different uh, components that are actual workloads that Argo is going to be installing for us in the background. It'll take just a minute or so to boot these up, uh, depending upon what resources you've kind of given to, um, to Minikube. Um, and once these come up, then we can actually start connecting to it and actually see. So Argo is kind of a cool tool. It does have both a CLI and has a uh, UI. Um, and then also we will be working, interacting with it just through applying Kubernetes YAML manifest as well, which are in our repo. So we'll just let these, this boot up in a second. And once we do get it, then we should be able to log in pretty quickly um, and see that. Uh, in the meantime, if while, while you are waiting for your Argo CD instance to boot up, uh, we can get a couple more pieces installed to be able to connect with it over the CLI. We'll want to make sure we have Argo CD installed. Uh, so go ahead and install that command line interface, um, and we'll use that to configure it and make sure it's set up so we, we can tell it that it's going to be managing our cluster. Um, so just go ahead and uh, let that run and make sure you get Argo CD installed as your CLI. And once we see these are up and running, we'll be good to go. The uh, Argo CD server is the, the big one that we'll be wanting to talk the most to, um, at least to interact with directly. Um, the rest will be kind of the things that are doing all the work in the background for us. So let's see what we got. And I, I've historically have seen this take maybe about two minutes. So we're starting to see some of these pods coming up. Almost there. A couple more running. All right, it looks like we are stabilizing. We're running. We're not necessarily all ready yet, but uh, it looks like now we're seeing sort of those transition from being unready to ready. Great. So now that we've done that, we can actually start playing around with it. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go port forward to that 
Argo CD server, uh, and that's just going to give me the ability to talk to it on my local machine, um, since really this is like a Kubernetes cluster. It can be anywhere in the world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just expose that currently with a port forward. We're going to expose it on port 8080. You'll notice it's port forwarding to 443. We're going to kind of do some, not, we, we haven't really you know, configured any SSL certificates, so we will just want to uh, not verify anything like that if we go through it. Um, we'll, we will treat that as a trusted cert for, for today. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do is uh, there is a, uh, a, a default password that's been created for us here as well just to get us started. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that here uh, as dumped out to some random character string. Um, and if you have pbcopy installed, perhaps that'll be a little bit easier for you to be able to, uh, to grab that onto your clipboard. And then we're going to do, we're going to get Argo CD actually configured to manage our Kubernetes cluster. And then we're almost done with actually bootstrapping our, our environment, and then we'll actually get into our applications. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, log in. It's going to tell me, hey, like we can't trust this certificate because, well, it's self-signed. Uh, so we'll trust it for today. Um, I'm going to log in with admin and that password that we just obtained out of that Kubernetes manifest. It's nothing more than really just decoding the, uh, the, the secret uh, that has been created. Again, just an initial password um, that you should change in real life. But uh, so now we've got that nicely installed and we actually have Argo CD pointing and talking to our cluster on, on port 8080 that we port forwarded. And then the last thing to do here um, is to actually tell Argo CD, say, hey, we're going to actually ha add a cluster for you to manage and have the ability to talk to. Um, this is a pretty intrusive process. Like you have to, you're kind of give, giving root access to this process to be able to manage your cluster. Uh, you're telling it to manage your resources. There's plenty of ways you can firewall this a little bit more if you don't want to give as much control over. Um, and of course, nothing stops you from writing your own little shell scripts um, and giving specific uh, role-based access control to it. Uh, this dash dash in cluster is going to be appropriate if you're using Docker as your, um, uh, your driver for uh, Minikube. If you're using another driver like HyperKit, it uh, may not be appropriate, it may be okay. Depends on what, how your networking is really set up for, um, for your uh, Docker uh, environment or your hypervisor environment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to do this. It's going to tell me, hey, this is a pretty, pretty cluster level. This is a pretty sensitive operation. Cluster level privileges are going to be granted. So let us get this going here. It's going to create a couple different service accounts and role bindings, allowing it to really change a lot of things in our cluster. Um, and now we're pretty much set up. Uh, what we can go do now is actually go take a look at Argo CD, and I'm going to refresh here. It's going to tell me I'm going to get a nice big warning. Hey, this is a you know an unverified uh, certificate. It's on self sign, uh, so I'm just going to do the classic. This is unsafe. Hack around and skip through, and now we've got a nice little UI that's actually running in in, in this Argo CD cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that password once more, and we're going to log in uh, and see that. Well. Nothing is here yet. A nice blank canvas. So we're bootstrapped. We are ready to start fooling around. Uh, we're going to actually get some deployments going and actually uh, try to apply some updates and rollbacks and then see if we can configure a nice con a CD workflow to manage this for us. Um, going on back to our deck, I'll go full screen here. Uh, our next step is to actually build our application. So in this repository, I've given us a very simple application. Uh, let me see if I can go into presenter mode. Presentation mode, It'll be a little easier. Well, there we go. Um, so uh, we have a very, very simple uh, application here. It's just going to be a very Python, Flask app. We're just going to do a hello world here. Just when you reach, you access the uh, your yeah, that index uh, or base root URL will just return a nice uh, hello world message. So about as simple of a Flask app as we can get. Um, choose your own language. Python is a little bit simplest for what we're doing today. Um, and uh, we can start from there. Um, cool. And then let me exit out quickly here. And then uh, we have a very simple Docker image here as well that, uh, that is going to be built based off of uh, a very specific version of Python. Something that's really important here is we're trying to build reproducible images that shouldn't really change upon builds. Uh, the, uh, so a very good strategy to do that, so you're not just randomly building and letting uh, updates kind of leak into your build process, is to make sure you're always building from a specific version. So I grab the actual digest here. Um, can I actually use 
No, I cannot make this go a little bit larger easily. Uh, but we will be building from a very specific digest. Um, and uh, we this, this is a very simple Docker file, just really copying and installing Python with our dependencies, which are nothing more than just a simple uh, Flask dependency, again, pinned to a specific version um, that we will run uh, just using Python Flask. Uh, great. So now that we have that, we're actually going to deploy or create an image for us to be able to uh, to build from. Uh, we're going to name this. Let's just call it Greeter Server. Uh, you're welcome to name this whatever you would like. Uh, totally up to you. Uh, but let's go ahead and build our, our our server here from that Docker file. Uh, you'll find that it is in that directory, Greeter Server. So we'll see. We're just doing Docker build. We're building that directory, and we are tagging it with our username uh, slash greeter server latest. Uh, if you are not logged into uh, Docker Hub, go ahead and do that uh, right now. Uh, you can do that, of course, through a Docker login, username, uh, in my case, Will J. Schmidt. Um, and then I could enter into my enter my password in uh, to, uh, to log in. Um, and then once we do that and we're logged in, we can push that image to Docker, Docker Hub. In this case, we're just going to label it latest. Um, We'll see that when we go into our CD workflow, we'll actually tag with uh, more specific pieces there. We are going to really not approach things from a semver approach as much as we are going to approach things from more of a hash approach. Like the idea is for us to uh, version things based on their contents and not necessarily based off of some uh, decided on version, uh, since that just brings humans more into the loop for what we're trying to do. And we want to be releasing quite a bit more frequently than something like semver would really afford us when we end up with um, our patch versions in the thousands or minor versions in the thousands. Um, so we're just going to treat everything kind of as a hashable thing. Um, and we can see that we just have pushed to our Docker Hub repository, replace it with your own repo. Um, and uh, we should be able to see that, hey, we should have just pushed a new version that is tagged as latest here. Uh, we can see that it was pushed a minute ago. And then I'm going to grab that shawsum, the, the, the digest from our uh, for our image that we built uh, by doing a Docker inspect here and expand uh, just extracting out the repo digest. Um, something I will call out here that we won't get into during our session at all today is we're not going to actually do, uh, we won't be able to produce a really truly reproducible Docker container. Uh, something that's kind of unfortunate with, with a vanilla Docker uh, build is that timestamps are included into layers. And so, well, that means whenever you build again, that your contents will change, you'll get a new digest. Um, this is where like some other tools will help you a little bit better with that. There's tools like build. Uh, there's tools, uh, we, we use, I've mentioned Bazel rules, Docker, um, strips out all timestamps. So kind of, uh, it always is like a chuckle for, for new, new developers when they see like, Hey, why are all of our containers built 40, actually 52 years ago, uh, since they're all basically have a timestamp of zero. So it just shows all of our builds, kind of uh, those images built on the Unix uh, epoch. Um, but uh, so an unfortunate side effect here is we will see these, these digests change a little bit more frequently than we would like to in today's session. Uh, outside of this, there's plenty of approaches and tools that you could use to, uh, to actually strip out those details and make a truly hermetic, reproducible Docker image. Um, Cool. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just pause here to see have we all been able to build our image, or do we run into any issues yet with uh, actually building and pushing these images to Docker Hub? All right. Beautiful. Cool. So uh, so now that we have this, and I can just uh, dump this out. Uh, the output here is actually going to be a little bit more than a uh, just the the digest. We'll see actually like the full path here of the new image that we just built is Will J Schmidt slash Greeter Server at a very specific shot. Again, we're not using a label. We're not doing a uh, we're not we're not looking at latest here. We're looking really at specifically how can we how can we get a very very specific exact version of our application that we're going to deploy. Um, so now that once we have that, we're going to actually go take a look at actually how we've configured deployment. So uh, ignore these, these YQ commands for the moment, and then we'll ignore uh, a couple other pieces on the next slide for just a moment, and we're going to go take a look at what we're deploying. So um, in my repository here, the way I've laid this out, um, we tend to take like a monorepo approach at right foot. 
Um, and so we'll see here similarly, like I've laid out my repository to be like a config directory that has really all of the configurations and deployment instances, um, and then a, uh, a, a source code repository. In this case, we'll just call it your reader server. Um, nothing says you don't, you can, uh, you have to put them in the same repository. You can definitely spread these across repos, but it'll be much simpler for today to do that. So you'll see in our config directory, which is where I'm actually gonna instantiate pieces here, I'm going to actually just create two deployments, one for a production environment, one for a staging environment. Uh, and then the production folder here, uh, and then the deployment folder, uh, sorry, that is not the right file, the deployment uh, for staging environment. Uh, if I go ahead and let me split this over here, we'll see they're almost exactly the same thing. They're just two different deployment environments. One is maybe gonna have API keys for prod uh, services that are downstream. One will have uh, for staging resources. Uh, but this is a very, very, very simple Kubernetes uh, deployment where what we're gonna do is we're going to just say, hey, we're gonna call one greeter service production, one greeter service staging, uh, they are going to just have one replica. We don't, we're not like doing anything here. We're no, no, not some sort of high availability uh, service. Um, we're gonna limit the revision history uh, to three. We'll see that could be a problem if we left it kind of unbounded that like our Argo CD is gonna see the like thousands of revision uh, or replica sets in the history there otherwise. Uh, so we'll leave it just to three to keep it straightforward. And then we're gonna just configure this just, hey, like we've got some labels here for our, uh, our deployment that's just greeter service is the name of our app. Our environment is production. Uh, and then our template, which really defines like what our pods look like, is going to be greeter service production again, the same, same labels. And then all we're gonna do, the real um, core part of the, the, this YAML file here, is we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna have one container here. It's gonna be running the image willjschmidt slash greeter server add a specific digest version. Uh, we're going to just set up a image pull policy if not present. Uh, if you happen to decide, you can make this work with a local uh, Docker uh, registry rather than uh, doing this on the internet or like using the Docker uh, cache uh, in built into Minikube. Uh, you would want to change this to a never uh, for local development. Um, but then we're just gonna name this image nicely as greeter server and just call out that we're exposing port 5000 is what's gonna be listening on today. Similarly, for the staging environment, we got the staging environment over on the right. Pretty much exact same thing. We're actually running the same version right now, uh, same container image. Um, so when we come to this in the future, when we want to make like an upgrade or a downgrade, like a rollback to these, uh, all we're doing is just going to be changing this SHA sum. The digest will get changed. That will allow us to be say, hey, I really want the production version to specifically use this version of our application. Um, and that is all we will do is when we want to make a release, we will be changing this line and this line only. That is all the release will become. Um, and then uh, the last piece that kind of pulls this all together to actually use our tool that we're using of the day, Argo CD, is we're gonna tell Argo CD that's, that's responsible for managing this stuff and it's responsible for reconciling these pieces. Um, so I've got one more file here called greeterservice.applications.yaml. Um, and in here, we will see that there's two applications that are defined, one for staging, one for production. And all it's doing is it's going to say, hey, I have uh, I've got a Git repository that is stored centrally somewhere that Argo CD can go ahead and talk to. It's gonna be my GitHub, Will J. Schmidt, the actual root of here. If you ran that setup code, it should have changed this to uh, your own personal fork. Um, we're gonna target head, meaning that we're always gonna look at the head stable branch, the mainline branch of this repository. And I specifically want it to manage this, this path, which is config slash greeter service dash staging. Uh, that will be the, the definition of this release. Um, I'm telling it, hey, I just wanna put it in my like default namespace and I wanna put it on our, our Kubernetes Minikube server that we configured earlier. And I'm gonna do one more thing here is I'm gonna give it a sync policy which says I want it to automatically just update. Uh, Argo CD doesn't have to be totally automatic. Uh, you can let it be a little bit more uh, imperative, but since we're going with this very declarative approach, we're gonna say, hey, I want you to actually automatically uh, sync up to any changes here and also delete stuff by pruning it if necessary. Um, and we'll say allow empty uh, just for, for kicks because who knows what we're gonna do with our service. So uh, this sync policy is gonna make us automatically actually update anytime we make changes to our deployment.yaml file. And then the same thing, we're gonna do the same exact thing for production and we'll see the only difference here is that this is going to be based off of greeter service production. So very simple, two applications, we're telling Argo CD hey, you're gonna use this Git repo, you're gonna use these two paths, and you're gonna operate from there.
Cool. So uh, now all we've got to do is actually tell, uh, tell Argo CD about these pieces. Um, so let me come back over to our slides here. Um, and what we're going to do, since we just built these images and you're going to have pushed them to your own Docker hub or some other Docker registry, uh, let us go use YQ in order to replace those pieces. Uh, you'll see it is, uh, it is a long YQ command, but just to break it down, we're telling YQ, which is, again is like our YAML querying tool. We're saying in place because we're going to update our file in place. We're going to do YAML round trip because JSON is technically YAML and YAML is a superset of, of JSON. We don't want to put it back into JSON. We'll, we want it to stay the YAML in the end. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to use a nice simple query saying dot spec dot template dot spec dot containers. The first one dot image is going to be now replaced with the SHA-256, the digest that we had just extracted from Docker a minute ago on our staging deployment YAML and our production deployment YAML. And so doing that, we'll, we'll take our latest build that we have uh, for that image. I'm going to go ahead and run that with our, for both environments. Let's just say we're going to update, upgrade both environments for posterity. Uh, you will all need to make sure you do this now because you are, we want to make sure you're running from your own Docker Hub registry rather than mine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run that. And I'm going to go run, what's that? Nope, not necessary since we're not passing it into YQ. We're, we're going to just expand it on the, uh, uh, on the shell. So no need to export it in this case. Cool. Um, and now what we should see is we should see a git diff here. And we'll see the only diff that's changed is just that, hey, these two images have changed. And very specifically, the diff is really exclusively located, in my case, to uh, the actual digest value. In your case, it will be updating to actually uh, your repository as well. So you should see Will J. Schmidt should have been replaced with something else. Cool. So now that we've done that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to commit this to, uh, to basically update it for our local build that we've done and make sure you can do this as well because um, we're going to start with a base version that actually works for us. I'm going to go ahead and commit that and I'm just going to go push that um, to origin. Um, boom, I've got that now push. I can go take a look um, at GitHub and see that uh, we have a new version there. Um, let's see. Slash shit. Boom. Don't want to go to polls, uh, but we'll see it there. Hey, I just I just pushed a commit there, uh, and that commit, of course, was just updating our SHA sum. Um, so now that we've got that going, we actually are about ready to deploy our uh, base version of our of our, our services without having made any modifications to it yet. Um, so go, if you go ahead, we looked at applications file already, that YAML file. What we want to do is actually apply this, and this is going to tell now Argo to finally start managing this. So as simple as that, we're going to come over and uh, we're going to just go kubectl apply that YAML file. And boom, we've got two different applications that we've created. This is just Kube, Kubernetes telling us, you know, hey, it did, did actually do something for us. Uh, but let's go take a look back at that uh, localhost 8080, and we'll see that Argo CD is picking these up and seeing that there's two different instances that we're running of our application, a uh, production instance and a staging instance. And we can see, all right, cool, like Kubernetes is going to start doing stuff. It's going to actually tell it, it actually grabbed from our Git repo the data for this. You'll see actually up at the top here, you'll see it synced up from GitHub. It grabbed, it said configuring images for the fork, configuring images fork. That was the that was that message that I had just uh, written in our commit log. Um, and it's grabbed that latest version, and we'll see that, hey, like a pod has been deployed with that specific image version uh, starting in 1.4 Bravo Charlie. And let's go double check that that is indeed what we had just updated it to. Um, and that is the case 1.4 Bravo Charlie. Um, so now we have two instances running that. Let's just make sure that they're actually running on our machine. I can go ahead and see kubectl get pods. Uh, I'll watch them just to make sure they're there. And yeah, we've got two pods that are running. Now, the, the interesting thing that's happened here is that we haven't actually, like Argo CD, in this case, we didn't like tell it to run these, these deployments directly. We told it to go look at this Git repository, and then we pushed something to the Git repository, and it went and retrieved that from, from, from GitHub rather than our local machine. So it retrieved that from GitHub, pulled that down, and decided, hey, it's time to do 
uh, a deployment. And this is what the deployment means. It in ended up including these two pods. Um, so now what I can do is actually let's like look at those pods and make sure they're running. The service is doing what we expected it to do. I'm going to go ahead and cube cuddle port forward to our, our staging instance right now. Um, and we can go ahead and we'll get a port forward opened up in another uh, tab. Um, and then if I go ahead and uh, curl that, uh, it's a get request here, not a post, uh, localhost 8080, we will get a temporary redirect. Hilarious. All right, what have I done wrong here? Ah, not 8080, sorry, 5000. 5000 was the port that we, we, we port forwarded this on. So port 5000, we have uh, hello world now replying back to us a simple, simple server. Um, Cool. We've done, we, all we've done is deploy a service. We already knew how to do that with kubectl apply. How are we going to actually start doing something interesting now to actually upgrade and manage our releases? So let's, uh, let's go make a change. Um, and let's go actually make a change that's, that's useful for us. And we will go and say, let me pull up my slides once more. Um, let's uh, go actually, I'll skip over our CD process here for the moment. Um, and I'll, cause I'll revisit it in just one more second. Uh, but let's actually like go make a change to this and, and say that we want to run something new. So uh, go ahead, and there is a patch file in uh, the greeter server folder. What this is going to do is it's going to add support for uh, saying who we want to greet. Maybe the world isn't interesting. We want to greet the universe. Uh, so we're going to add that as support to our uh, Python script. Go ahead and apply that. You'll see the difference that is here is that I've just added a little bit more complexity to our handler. But we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to support a body parameter called greet in our JSON request. We're going to pull it out. Um, we're going to change it to a post method as well rather than a get request. Um, and then we're going to return hello greet instead of just hell, a static hello world. Um, now, of course, because we haven't changed anything, this is code that's running locally. If we curl requests, we should still see hello world. Um, and uh, the pods haven't changed. Nothing is updated yet. So what we're going to do is now um, we can commit this and say, hey, we're going to make a new change. This is just code change. Um, of course, there is one. That's a little bit of a bug there. Sorry about that, folks. If you copy then that, um, if you copy, end up copying in that little quote there. Um, Let's see if my shell handles that all right. Of course it doesn't. Uh, there we go. Uh, the classic, uh, when you type in quotes, that they want to make them into nice, fun uh, Unicode quotes. Um, and then uh, we can push this change. And we'll just say git push. Uh, now, nothing has changed. Nothing should change. We just pushed here. We'll see that Argo is nice and happy and saying nothing's being done right now. Uh, we'll see that we've, we, we did just push a new commit up to GitHub, of course, 23 seconds ago, which has just changed our Python code. Uh, but again, still, we well, didn't want to push it again, but that's all right. It's a no op. Um, we should still expect that we're not getting any new change because we haven't upgraded any of our releases yet. Um, so why don't we go ahead and do that now? Um, so let's just say, like, we're going to do this manually before we replicate this for staging. And let's, I'm going to put it to production because uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna, we're our CD job, we're not going to allow it to release to production today. Um, but let's just go upgrade our, 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 our production instance um, since we know we won't be playing with it too much more today. So I can do the exact same thing. Um, we're going to build our image locally. Let's so grab the right slide. We're going to go ahead and do the same build. I'm going to say docker build. Boom, boom, boom. It'll be a little bit, take a little more time since we don't have a cache hit as much. And then we'll do similarly again. We'll push that image. And then finally, I'll go grab our uh, digest for this push. Um, and then once, and then the last piece here is let's just update our production instance. And boom, there we go. The same command we ran earlier. Uh, and I'll make a commit here and say uh, git commit all dash dash message uh, upgrade production prod to support greety. So this is going to be a release now. And uh, all of our, our, our change entirely in this case will just be upgrading that, that digest. So if I go ahead and git push that, we will see it goes to uh, our GitHub instance, as per usual, uh, make sure I reflect that that's there. That is our commit. All we did was upgrade that just that digest. And what we'll find here is nothing's happening yet, uh, but the sync process will happen every three minutes by default. 
configurable. So rather than us sitting here waiting for three minutes, I'm just going to force a sync. And what's going to happen is uh, I'll go to the production specifically. Uh, I'm going to have it go take a look at, um, at what it looks like in Git. It is out of sync now because we did change something. Its old version was configuring images for fork. Uh, we want to actually, you know, we, we just push that change to upgrade prod. And you'll see a new replica set has been created because the, we did just change the definition of the deployment. The deployment has been changed. And so Kubernetes is now working on a rollout. It has just created this. Uh, we've got uh, new pods coming through. Uh, sorry, our, our new pod has already come up because uh, it's a very tiny server. It doesn't take a whole lot of time to boot it up. Uh, this isn't a JVM machine that's going to take us two minutes to boot. Uh, it's just Python. Um, and we'll see that the old version just got pruned out and is gone uh, from our release um, or from our, from our Minikube instance. So uh, if I come over here, if I try to actually access this port again, it will be a dead port. So I'm going to open up a new port forward to the new pod. And now what we should be able to see, actually, let me go over to here. Um, this is the staging instance. Well, let's go to staging, and then uh, I'll open up a new one here. Why not? Um, let's port forward to production on port 5001. Production. Did I call it prod or production? This is going to be the bane of my instance. I think I did production. Uh, production, and I was going to forward 5,001 to 5,000. Um, cool. Uh, and now if I go ahead and make that curl request that we made before, we'll see on 5,000, we still get hello world. Uh, but on 5,001, we're going to make a post request, and we're going to include a body now. Uh, and that will be, let's say, uh, greety. Uh, and we'll say universe uh, instead. And apparently, I've got a, do I have a bug in my, uh, I've got a 400 on here. What did I do in my Python script? Greety. Hmm. Well, ah, I know. Uh, I think I need to include uh, content type application slash json there we go uh just a little header mishap uh and so of course now our other service this, the production version was upgraded through that git commit that's all we did was we upgraded the version uh we made a commit we did we told that hey like let's just jump the gun and and, and get that synchronization to happen more quickly uh, and now we've got a new version running that's that's actually responding with totally different code uh, and all we had to do was make a git commit to make it happen um now of course like if we are unhappy with that choice and we realized oh shoot like we made it a little more complicated. Like now we have to accept application.json as a, as a header, um, maybe rather than assuming it, probably a good idea to do it anyways. Um, but, or we just didn't really like that we rolled out the production accidentally. Uh, the simplest thing that we need to do now is if we actually want to roll that back, we can go ahead and actually just revert that commit. That is all it's going to take to do a rollback. And so we're going to say git revert head, our latest commit. We're going to revert this. Uh, we're just going to maybe add some message in here and say, this was accidentally released to prod instead of, uh, of staging. Uh, now the uh, release will just be as much as we'll push that new commit that reverts our change. Um, and I'll just uh, tickle Argo to uh, just do a quick synchronize without it doing it automatically. Um, and we'll see that, hey, a new version has actually come back. We just released a new instance pretty much instantaneously. Um, and if I go to open that port forward once more, I um, can't type numbers. Um, we'll do that once more. And we'll see that uh, this curl request should go back to uh, hello world. Let me see. Did I connect to the old pod still? The old pod's terminating still and still serving traffic. Let's see if that's it now. No, still accepting that. Uh, talking the right series. Ah, yes, perfect. Okay, so now that the old pod's gone, we can see, hey, hey we, we can't put post requests to this service again anymore. Um, we would have to use a get request, and we're back to our old code version. All through just a single uh, git revert and a push. Great. So now uh, let's let's go actually like re release like a CD pipeline now. So like this is cool. Like but like the whole point of this was not to continue to include humans. It's nice we have like a Git log now. We have a commit reference that we can go through and say yeah this is like 
Will made this release. He was a dummy and released to production right away um, and broke, had all sorts of backwards compatibility breaks, et cetera. So we should go figure out how that happened. Um, but let's, let's say we've locked that down and we want to actually start automating some of this release and make sure it goes to staging first. Um, so what I've done is uh, for this, uh, this session, there is a, uh, a section here on, uh, there's another patch file here that's gonna inc include GitHub Actions workflow here uh, that will do this release process. So uh, let's go ahead and, and grab this, uh, this, apply this patch as well. Uh, this patch will be a much bigger patch because there's a lot more going on and I will walk us through it, uh, but it should be pretty familiar at this point. Um, so I get ahead and of course I've got a white space error because I made a maybe mistake in it. How did I manage? Oh, warning, it was just a warning. All right, we're okay with warnings. Not usually. You should always, you know, error on c compilation uh, for, for warnings, right? Um, cool. So uh, what I've done now, we've just got like, a, a, uh, a workflow that I've defined. Um, this is another good example. We're not, we're, we don't use GitHub, GitHub Actions uh, in our shop, but it uh, should be a little bit straightforward today. So I apologize if I make a mistake with GitHub Actions or some faux pas. Um, we're using Circle CI generally, uh, but the, uh, the steps should generally be the same, regardless of your CI tool that you've got. So uh, in this YAML here, and I'll enter into presentation mode again here since it'll be a little bit easier to read. Uh, what we're gonna do is configure GitHub Actions to do on any push to really our, our mainline branches. We're going to say, all right, on, uh, we're gonna run on just Ubuntu here. I'm going to pass in a few different tokens. Uh, this should have been replaced already with your username, um, but we're gonna pass in an authentication with GitHub, which I'll explain in a second, and then Docker Hub. Like, those are the two services that we wanna work with. Um, to get this set up, we will do a little bit more configuration with your GitHub repo, uh, but we're going to go actually now through just the, the workflow itself first. So um, first of all, we're going to check out our repository. Important to have the code available if we want to build it. Um, you'll see me kind of complaining again about the how Python YQ is better in this case. So we're going to use pip install YQ in this case to get that installed. Uh, that gives us YQ, which we will use just like we just used ourselves by hand. Uh, it's going to configure Git. I'm going to have it configured so it's just going to be ci at rightfoot.com configure it to whatever you email address and name you would like to use for your organization. Um, gonna log into Docker Hub. We're gonna use that token that we'll configure in a second as a secret, uh, as an environment variable. And then we're gonna do exactly the same thing we did before, um, except a couple tiny modifications here. So you'll see I've done, a, I'm doing a Docker build once more with, we're gonna tag it latest. Um, but what we're gonna also do is we're gonna, we're gonna tag it with the SHA that we built it from. That helps us know that, hey, if you ever wanted to go see what versions could be uh, replic replicable for the code base, we can go from an image, take a digest, go see what tags are on it and see, hey, this git commit actually reflects the state of the code base for that. That makes it very easy for us to go backwards when we go see something that's running in production and, or running in one environment. And we've got you know, maybe 10 different versions running in different environments. Uh, we can actually go work our way back and say, those are the, the, the digest, this is our uh, git commits that were associated with it. We can go take a look at the code base at that point in time and see maybe what the bug is there, uh, since it can be uh, pretty confusing when you've got multiple versions running. Um, and then we're just going to push that again uh, just to, uh, to um, Docker Hub. Uh, we're gonna then, of course, grab it. So we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing we did before. We're gonna grab it. We're gonna be like a little more stable here rather than just use latest. We're gonna use actually that SHA um, for the commit. And we're gonna still get our repo digest and say, cool, our current image hash is SHA-256. Um, and uh, just to share it between steps, we're gonna dump it into our environment um, with, uh, for, for GitHub Actions. And now we're gonna do the, pretty much the same thing, but we're gonna do one more big important piece. We're gonna first, we're gonna go, we're, we're doing staging here. We're just configuring an automatic staging release. Um, we're gonna do that YQ in place as before. Uh, but we're gonna do kind of two, or one big thing now. Um, we're gonna actually automatically propose this as a potential release. And so uh, to do that, we're gonna first be like, well, did our code change and re re result in a digest change and then therefore when we did a YQ in place, did the, the YAML file update? And if it didn't, then we exit because there's nothing to do. And if it did, then we're gonna keep going and what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna make a new branch. I'm gonna call it something kind of useful like release slash our service name slash the environment and then the commit that we built it from. Um, and we're going to sit, we're going to make a commit here and we're going to, we're just going to call it something really generic, just like upgrading server, uh, the, 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 the staging environment, um, and push it. 
and then finally create an actual pull request for it. We're going to say, hey, make a pull request titled this with a body. Uh, we're going to go from our new branch into main, uh, into our stable branch. Um, and this process will just create a PR. Uh, I did mention we won't go cover like auto approval and auto merge today, but we'll, we'll show how this works at least, and we, we'll, we'll just do it by hand today. Um, but you could add uh, our organization, you will use a combination of authorship and labels on this. We'll like add a dash dash label auto merge and a dash dash label CI uh, to signify, hey, maybe this is a safe pull request to merge in. Um, and uh, let's just go ahead and, and add this to our repository and tell GitHub to start doing this. Um, and so let's go ahead and I'll go back to my terminal. Uh, we'll see, uh, we should see that, hey, that has been changed. Um, there is a nice big new file here. Uh, we have to add that file uh, in. Uh, we'll just do the whole directory, uh, commit dash uh, M, and we'll say add uh, a CD workflow uh, to release to staging. Uh, write better commit messages than I am today uh, in your real life. Uh, but for brevity here, we will go ahead and just push this as is. So now what we'll find is uh, if I come back over to our Git repo, uh, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I did skip over one piece there, switching back and forth. You will need to go in since we did add before you push this if you want it to succeed. Uh, I did mention that there are a couple secrets that we need to configure, and that's GH token and Docker Hub token. Um, let me pull up the slides here to signal that. But you will go to your repo. Uh, make it a little bit bigger, go to the settings for your repository, uh, go ahead on into, I believe, uh, sorry, it's in the secrets category, secrets actions, um, and you should go ahead and set two secrets, Docker Hub token and GH token, which are essentially OAuth tokens you can get from GitHub, either through an OAuth token um, for, for GitHub, make sure it has the repo access or repo scope uh, added to it, um, and then uh, similarly to Docker Hub token, go grab a, a token there from this URL, make sure it has read write access to your uh, repo. Uh, so cool, if you, assuming that you've done that uh, and we've pushed that there, we will find that uh, coming over here, there is now a, a nice little green check mark which is good. We want to make sure that's that not a nice red cross right now. Uh, and this will be that action workflow that we just added on. Uh, and you'll see that everything kind of happened here. We'll see that we, we pushed an image to Docker Hub, which will be a new image. Uh, we, we can grab that image digest that says, hey, this is our new image digest, which is starting in Delta 7 Echo instead of our 1.4 Bravo uh, that we had before. Uh, and then we'll see that, hey, there's a, we're going to commit this um, and make a pull request for it. And if we look, there is a nice little one up there. And we have a pull request that was automatically created. And, and the, um, the contents of it are automated PR to upgrade, update greeter service staging image to, uh, to greeter server server with to Delta 7 Echo. And the file change that's been proposed here is essentially this is the, we have automation now proposing a release through GitOps that says, cool, I want to upgrade to this version. Um, and me knowing what kind of has happened, it's going to be uh, happy with this. Uh, I don't, I, if I were, this would be proposed by a service instead of myself, I might go through an approval process. Um, but since we were doing nice lightweight here, we don't have any, any branch checks or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and merge that on in. Uh, this is now essentially accepting the release proposal and the release is to begin. Um, we'll go back over and I'll, I'll tickle this so that it uh, syncs more quickly rather than waiting the default three minutes. And we should see sync is happening and we have a new uh, release coming out here where containers being created in staging uh, and the old version is terminating uh, on our local machine on, in Minikube because it did pulse onto GitHub and see that a new release uh, configuration is available. Uh, and uh, let me go and make a request to it just to prove that's the case. Uh, let's do that. And now we should see that if I try to curl uh, 5,000, it's, uh, we still have, do we still have it running over there? Yeah, we still have the old, the old pod still running. We'll wait for the, the deployment to complete. Okay, let me, Report forward because I'm clearly port forwarding to the old pod. And now we'll see that like, I'm trying to make a get request and get requests are not allowed. Um, we've actually made the correct uh, release that we wanted to. I can go actually force, go make that actual legitimate request and we can see our staging environment is now hello universe. It's actually responding to a greet he with a body rather than just giving us a static hello world back to us. Um, 
just like before we could revert this, but we're gonna leave that alone now and say that we've got like, we've essentially now gotten to the point where we have an automated CD pipeline that's going to propose releases. And those releases are all kept contained within our Git uh, workflow. We can apply whatever we really want to uh, on top of that, whatever your Git workflows are in your organization, uh, since they do uh, vary pretty, pretty wildly uh, between orgs. So uh, we are rounding the turn, kind of about to the end here. Some things that we didn't cover uh, in here that would be important in uh, a more of a real life environment. Uh, one, uh, we now, especially if we run this as a monorepo, chances are like many different services aren't gonna change on every single commit. It'd be a bummer to have to like rebuild some really heavy images uh, from scratch every single time. So. Introduce caching would be really great um, to make sure that you minimize the amount of work that your CD processor are doing, and hopefully all release all these are generally no ops. Um, we don't have really a deterministic builds right now because uh, if we did try to do a Docker build again, it would include a timestamp in the build. Um, so we'll see some some chatter. We'll make unnecessary releases that are not really doing anything different to the service. Um, so there are some, there's a couple different really good tools for this. Uh, Buildaw is one that does allow you to really kind of strip out those timestamps as you're using it. Um, it is quite different from a Docker file, but uh, it follows very similar patterns. Um, we use Bazel uh, as a build system. That's uh, Google's open source version of their internal build system called Blaze. Uh, and that we, uh, rules Docker has basically the ability to create container images uh, deterministically. Also has a really good caching system uh, for building uh, really, really specifically, not even rebuilding you know, a specific Java file or, or, or C++ file or Golang file or recompiling uh, unless it was affected by a change. Um, and then something that, you know, hey, like that, that wasn't a really amazing pull request. The pull request just changed stuff, but didn't say what it did. Um, creating change logs is a really good idea if you're doing releases, like automatic releases here in GitOps. This is a really good opportunity to put change logs in with the commit that says, hey, we're making a release here. Especially if it's automated, we can automatically generate change logs for those pull requests. Um, also, uh, you know, something that can happen here is like race conditions. Well, another commit gets made to uh, to our main branch, it will propose the exact same change because, well, it hasn't been merged in yet. Um, so we have raised conditions here with we may want to deduplicate those pull requests. Um, and then we, we also, you know, to actually go further forward with this to make it feel like a little bit more complete environment, we may want to actually actually build out a microservice mesh showing many different services and how we might upgrade some of the ser services uh, independent from each other uh, and do releases uh, to each one of those. Uh, the last thing I would say here is like some other tools that are really helpful for these types of uh, to this type of work. Um, these these do help with all these workflows. They can be composed together however you really see fit. I mentioned Bazel. We're a big fan of using Bazel for our build system. Uh, Scaffold complements that as well. Uh, but is, is Scaffold is a good uh, local development way for running um, running some of these environments on Minikube. Uh, or for integration testing in a live cluster. Uh, we used Argo CD today, but there is Flux CD. They're both part of the um, Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Uh, they are both, I think, I think both in incubating projects right now. Uh, they haven't gone full GA yet. Uh, they haven't graduated. Uh, Terraform, we use Terraform uh, in our organization to accomplish really kind of the same things. Instead of having Argo CD do a sync with the Git repo, we just have on push hooks, uh, we, uh, we just run Terraform apply. Usually then if there's no changes, Terraform apply is just a no-op. Uh, so it's very sim functionally similar, just with a couple other downsides uh, and some upsides too. Uh, and then finally, Helm customize. We didn't do any like configuration of like, you know, ha like how we run our services. We didn't like configure API keys or some other feature flag or something like that. Uh, those are all things that you would want to manage and can manage. Now you're kind of doing everything through a GitOps approach. You're updating a values.yaml file that can just be a Git commit by a developer saying, hey, we want to turn this feature on in this environment. And that can be proposed and say, hey, we are ready to turn this feature on in production. And that is the same exact workflow um, as releasing an image update. Um, and then finally, of course, you can use uh, the many different uh, reposit or central um, managed Git uh, deployments that you have, like GitHub and GitLab. Uh, we use GitHub today, but of course, plenty of other options out there. And you don't even have to use Git if you don't want to. Use, use whatever version control system you've got, um, depending upon your organization. Uh, so that brings us really right up to the end of that. Uh, thank you very much for coming out to work through a full Git, uh, GitOps uh, release and rollback pipeline. Um, 
plenty of different tools you can play with and plenty more for that you can go with it. So uh, I'll open up and see if there's, I haven't heard any questions uh, throughout it. So uh, either you all are still stuck installing Minikube or, uh, the, uh, or it was that straightforward and simple and maybe I should have thrown much more aggressive uh, deployment strategies. The next, next session will include more interesting uh, like blue green deployments, et cetera. But uh, any questions here from the group? Yes? <laughs> uh, I, do, I do not know, but I, I, I wish I could uh, definitely give you, uh, give you a PhD in this if I could. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, Say that once more. See, I changed the code, right? Yes. So 